Hi everyone. We welcome you to the second episode of Chair Professorship series and this time we are back with another legendary marketing expert none other than Dr. Mohan Bir Swani. He is a noted management consultant, author, academic and a teacher by passion. He has been associated with some of the leading companies across the world. He serves as the board of directors in Reliance Geo Infocom. Besides that, in full time he is associated with Kellogg School of Management as McCormick Foundation Professor of Digital Innovation and he has done significant amount of work in digital marketing, digital innovation. In fact, he was one of the pioneers of online executive education in the world. And without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Mohan Bir and uh, we begin this conversation with your opening remarks, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you in this conversation and uh, I'm delighted to be able to see the vision of uh, Watson University uh, come to life from almost 10 years ago when it was literally a hole in the ground. So I'm excited about the possibilities as well as this uh, unique idea of uh, creating endowed chairs of professorships in uh, with leading academics around the world. So glad to be part of this initiative. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So we have heard a lot about your work in the area of digital marketing, digital innovation, specifically in the field of technology innovation, right? So do you ever feel that pressure of, uh, you know, coming up with novel concepts, even now with uh, the fast changing uh, global environment? Actually, I wouldn't call it pressure. I'd call it stimulation. It's, it's really, uh, I think, you know, they say a rolling stone gathers no mass. So I find it uh, the world of technology intersecting with business, which is what I spend a lot of my time on. And also technology as an enabler and driver of innovation uh, is just very exciting. It's, uh, there's uh, so change and uh, uh, disruption uh, really also creates opportunity, opportunity to think about new frameworks, new concepts, new phenomena. So uh, yes, it does take effort. It does take uh, sort of that uh, ability to continue to reinvent uh, oneself, coming up with new ideas, but uh, it's also is very, very stimulating. So I wouldn't have it any other way. Awesome. So I understand that you love by this very statement that you feel that it's it's more of a stimulation rather than pressure. So you enjoy being in the company of students and faculties and I'm sure in the corporates as well. Uh, my next question, uh, Dr. Swani, is so what are some of the key trends that you're seeing in the field of marketing as we are now seeing uh, this VUCA world, especially with the COVID pandemic, uh, things have changed pretty much. So in your opinion, what are some of the key, uh, you know, trends that you're seeing around? So if we think about the, the history and the legacy of marketing, it has been uh, a discipline that has really emphasized insight, creativity, intuition, and uh, sort of the right brain aspects of uh, of thinking but uh, I think what is happening well, and in fact has been happening over the past 10 to 15 years is that marketing is also becoming a data-driven fact-based technology powered uh, discipline so now I think uh, creativity doesn't go away you know that sort of right brain doesn't go away but it's been complemented and augmented by sort of the left brain aspects of marketing, uh, which is marketing automation, marketing analytics, the application of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, as well as the application of digital technologies for customer engagement and, uh, uh, and, and customer outreach, which obviously was accelerated during the pandemic when digital channels became even more important. So. So I'm very excited about the future of marketing because it really now engages sort of the 360 degree faculties of your brain, left brain and the right brain. Um, so storytelling is still important, customer insights is still important. But now, you know, to give you an example, we are using AI to gain customer insights from ethnographic research. 
So ethnography, for instance, has always been a, a creative and a qualitative discipline, but now we can quantify those insights. So, so the future of marketing really is sort of this combination of data analytics and automation and uh, with insights, with creativity, with intuition. So that's, I think, the big theme. Now within that, there are sub themes, of course, of uh, the emergence of digital channels, the emergence of uh, new environments and new experiences like the metaverse, which allow you to sort of uh, create a much more realistic and immersive customer experiences. Um, and also the availability of massive amounts of data from new sources that we didn't have before, location data, sensor data, social data. So uh, it's a very rich discipline and uh, pretty excited about the possibilities, but it just will take sort of a combination of, uh, you have to be half of a machine learning and data scientist and half a storyteller and creative person. So that's, I think, a really exciting place to be. Awesome, I mean, I totally agree. And especially if you look at some of the people uh, in, in the field of academia and also in the corporates feel that we have reached that sort of saturation level um, in, in terms of innovation, but I feel there's no saturation at, at this point because we are seeing a lot of uh, new uh, techniques and tools coming into the picture, especially like Metaverse is a new concept. Uh, you, talk, you, you, you talked about uh, how, how the creativity and the uh, various uh, facets of the traditional marketing converges along with the technology side of things like data analytics, artificial intelligence, automation completely. Right. So my next question, uh, Dr. Swani, is I'm sure you have interacted with a lot of students, uh, thousands and thousands of students across your academic journey, and especially at Kellogg's where you spend more than 30 years. Right. So you've always uh, spoken about something called sell the outcome and not the product. So could you tell us more about that? Because I'm very curious when I heard about this, I'm sure a lot of management students would like to know about that as well. So. What are your thoughts? Well, why don't we actually take an example of management education? When, uh, when a student comes and takes my class, I teach a product management class. Uh, you know, what, why are they really there? I ask myself that the outcome they're looking for is not that they want to learn product management. That's a, that's a, that's a mistake we make. We think they are here to learn, but they're not here to learn, they're here to earn. Yeah. So uh, the outcome that they're looking for from say my product management class is a, I want to be able to get a job as a product manager. Um, and B, when I get the job, I want to be successful. I want to be, you know, uh, a good product manager. So now this might sound like a cliche. Okay, they're here to become a better product manager, not just learn about product management. But I took this idea of the outcome and designed my product management course backwards. The, so instead of saying, well, here's the theory, here's the different uh, things you need to learn. I first went and talked to a set of senior product managers, my alumni, my former students and said, what do you guys do as product managers? You know, what are the decisions you make? What are the issues you run into? What are the questions in your mind? And then working backwards from there, I, I designed the course to support those outcomes, to enable those outcomes. So every module that I teach actually is targeted towards a decision and a question, like how do you take a product to market successfully? So I have a module on go-to-market strategy. Right? How do you find product opportunities and how do you convert those into products that customers would love? I created a module around that. So the idea here is that, uh, as the old cliche goes, that customers, you know, don't buy quarter-inch drills; they buy quarter-inch holes. So we really have to focus on the outcome. And and this is uh, quite elegantly captured in the uh, sort of this concept or framework of jobs to be done. And which is what I teach also in my product management classes, that let's focus on the customer's job to be done because a customer doesn't buy a product. A customer hires a product to get a job done. And by focusing on what that outcome is and working backwards from there, we are not fixated on the product, but we are actually fixated on the customer because your product is only one means of solving the customer's problem, of them achieving that outcome. You know, we are sitting here in a beautiful lawn, right? So let's say you have a lawn like this in your house. Um, and I am a, selling a product, which is a robotic lawnmower. So what is the outcome my customer is buying? They're not buying a robotic lawnmower. They're not even buying a lawnmower. They want their yard to look pretty. 
by the way, if supposing there's a drought here, we might decide that we put a fake lawn here. We might decide that we pave this and put concrete. We might plant trees. We might create a cactus garden. Those are all different ways of making the yard look pretty. So focusing on that outcome, by the way, even if I do decide that I want a lawn, there are lots of ways of keeping this lawn maintained. I can either hire somebody to mow the lawn. I can buy a goat, right? Uh, or, or I can uh, use a gas powered lawn mower, or I can use a robotic lawn mower. So that's the idea, right? So I'm not in the market for a lawn mower. I'm in the market for making my yard, making my front, uh, my house look beautiful. So that's the idea of focusing on the outcome. Absolutely. I mean, I totally agree and very well explained with the help of an example of a lawn mower and stuff. I think I totally agree with that. Uh, to some extent, I would just want to add up to what you said. People say that it's not selling the product to a customer. It's helping the customers buy the product. Right. So it's more of a consultative mindset that you need to come up with. Because of course, as you rightly mentioned, the customers should be at the core of the business. And it's not about you meeting your numbers, but it's about how much uh, and how, how satisfactorily you can convince your customers to buy your product. Right. Right. My next question to you, Dr. Swani, is uh, companies across the world are nowadays focusing on newer uh, technologies, right? Whether it is quantum computing, machine learning, right? So, in in such kind of a environment where we are growing every day, what are the top three things that any company across the world should focus on in order to disrupt the market? I think that um, the biggest challenge that I see companies face in staying relevant and staying competitive is not based on technology it's not i mean the technology yes you have to keep abreast of the latest trends it's it's change management it's people it's getting the people to uh, to go along with the change so uh, building a culture that values experimentation that values uh, risk taking that values intelligent failure that rewards intelligent failure that's that's challenging because otherwise people tend to you know follow Newton's first law, an object at rest tends to remain at rest until impelled by an external force. So uh, so that is, I think, one of the things that I would, I would say is a task of leadership is to create a culture of experimentation, agility, and sort of, you know, where people are not afraid to take risks, not afraid to kind of try something new because innovation always involves some risk. And I think the, uh, the other thing is to sort of make sure that you are embracing the possibilities of technology, that you are uh, at the leadership team level really kind of driving. It's not seeing technology as an IT project and letting the CIO run this. It has to really be, uh, technology has to be in service of business strategy. You know, what are we trying to accomplish? What are the goals that, that, that we want and how we're going to power through that? And I think that leaders need to be personally involved and have a visceral understanding of the possibilities of technology. You can't just delegate it to your people. Um, and I think finally, I'd say that um, uh, that we are uh, in a war for talent. So I think that is sort of the third thing really is to make sure that you have uh, the people and the talent and are able to retain, acquire, but also retain the talent that will be needed to power your organizations into the future. So, uh, so paying attention to uh, re finding the best talent, uh, developing the talent, retaining the talent, and being personally involved in the selection of key people. So that's, I think, uh, the third thing that I would say. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at uh, some of the comp some of the top companies, they do focus on uh, in getting involved, as you rightly mentioned, in the processes, and that's how they are able to take the people along with them forward. Right, because as much as the HR managers or the you know the various function managers are involved in the process, it's important for the the top leader of the company also to be involved in the entire process of recruiting the best talent, retaining the best talent, and ensuring that as a company we come up with the best people and the best processes. Right, and also to be um, hold people accountable for execution. You know, and this is something that I've seen really close up in my work with Reliance, so that I serve on the board of Geo since its inception. It's very much the vision of uh, Mukesh Ambani and Manoj Modi, and uh, 
And I can tell you that uh, I have personal experience in, 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 I can say for a fact that they are so conversant with the nuts and bolts of a very complex technology business that literally they can sit across the table from the chief technology officer of Apple or Facebook and Microsoft and, uh, you know, and nobody can bullshit their way through. So I think when your people know that, uh, and this is not their native background, both Manoj and Mukesh are chemical engineers, but I think their personal involvement, personal passion, uh, and that sort of you know, leading from the front is what execution is all about. Otherwise, you know, strategy is PowerPoint documents. You know, so uh, so so absolutely. I mean, it is uh, it is it is said that uh, that in the early days of uh, Microsoft, when you were in a meeting with Bill Gates, he could drill down to a line of code and tell you how to write that line of code better than you had done it. And people were afraid, and you know, and then they respected uh, his expertise. So I think that's what a true leader needs to do. Uh, you can't just sort of you know, do this by remote control and, you know, sitting in your corporate boardroom and not uh, get your hands dirty. So I think that is uh, something that I've seen is, is, is characteristic and, and actually is also is representative of what is happening at your institution. You know, it's uh, the personal vision and the involvement of uh, the founder and then the team that is created around them. Uh, you very much has to, so I think founder driven companies have that advantage with the clarity of purpose, a sense of mission, uh, and that's what just drive execution. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. So as much as you've spent your time in the industry with a lot of consulting assignments, getting involved in the advisory processes of some of the leading companies, uh, you've spent equal or more amount of time with the students in the classrooms as well. So. I'm sure you've had your own set of unique experiences teaching at Kellogg. So how did that impact you as a person in particular and your teaching in academia in general? So I think we literally draw energy from students. I, mean, I, I like to say, say that I teach at a university because it keeps me young because uh, every, every fall when I come back, I say, you know, the students are getting younger every year <laughs> it's actually i'm getting older every year but it's really i think is very energizing to be in the presence of uh, young minds and bright minds and by the way it's not just students it's also i spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs i learn so much from entrepreneurs because they are really pushing the frontier trying new things uh, trying to change the world so uh, spending time with them and advising them working closely with uh, them also really keeps me at the cutting edge so i think that really a combination of working with corporations, working with entrepreneurs, and then interacting with students. And by the way, when I say students, it's not only MBA students, it's executive students, senior executives. Uh, it really is a very nice cross flow where what you're teaching and advising and consulting sort of is all feeding uh, into each other. There's a lot of cross pollination. So, you know, so today I might be you know, in an advisory meeting and tomorrow I'm in the classroom discussing some of the insights there. So, uh, so I think teaching informs consulting and consulting informs teaching and, uh, and, and that informs the research and the case writing. So yeah. it's, it's all sort of a synergistic whole. Uh, and that's what I uh, really enjoy about the job because it's uh, almost like three, four jobs rolled into one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, as much as you enjoy with, uh, you know, teaching the students and the faculties, students and faculties, I'm sure, enjoy doubly more being with you in your company. Uh, another question that comes to my mind as we have this conversation, Dr. Swani, is uh, you have been one of the pioneers in online executive education. So at this point in time, in today's day and age, how do you see the market of this executive education in India? and uh, more so generally in the world? See, in India, we have obviously a very large population and we have a very large base of uh, uh, students who need to be trained and skilled. So um, access, affordability, and uh, without compromising quality will remain a challenge. By the way, that's a challenge in India in any sector, whether it's healthcare or retail or you know agriculture but if you look at education we need to provide quality education to hundreds of millions of, uh, of students all the way from kindergarten up to sort of advanced degrees and um, 
it's just not going to be possible to build the real estate and to build the sort of, you know, uh, number of schools and colleges that we need. And even the ones that we have, we need to use their fullest potential uh, because sometimes you may have a school, but you may not have the best quality teachers. They may not have the best access to the best quality content. So that is where technology comes into play, right? So it's not just online executive and online ed education. It's also sort of using digital technologies to improve access, whether it's tablets or digital content or learning management systems or, you know, so, so look at Baiju's for instance, or, you know, these, these, so, and it's, and, and it's through the whole spectrum all the way from kindergarten up to the advanced degrees. So I think that there's a lot of uh, potential in, uh, in democratizing access to high quality education uh, by using digital. Digital technology allow you, allow you to scale, yeah. allow you to scale the impact. And we saw this during the pandemic when we were all forced to go digital. But, uh, but I think in the future, what we will need to do is to blend the yes. in-person modalities with the uh, digital modal modalities and come up with models of uh, at various ends of the uh, points in the spectrum of fully in-person to fully online but uh, i'm excited about the possibilities and i think india can really be a leader uh, but we have to grow sort of homegrown models not just look at what's going on in the west because the challenges in the west for education are different yeah. uh, and uh, the price points are different so uh, so one of the things that we are doing now with the courses the online courses that i've created in executive education is we are launching them in the indian market and, and that requires uh, localization of content, adding you know case studies that are relevant to the Indian context, but also bringing other price points where it's affordable. Uh, so, so I think that's uh, that's what we have to do is to uh, create homegrown solutions, use AI to create personalized learning pathways. Um, and I think the biggest opportunity is at the bottom of the pyramid, where you have uh, uh, a lot of schools really at the uh, once you get out of the big cities and once you get out of the top tier schools are really not delivering the quality of education that uh, that the students need and uh, and the government schools can actually really be reinvented as they are now some in the in the in north india uh, some of the transformations taking place in government schools is is worth seeing as also some pockets in the south so if we scale that and make the government schools really world class i think it can transform the country absolutely i mean uh, as you rightly mentioned that uh, there is no one size that fits all. I mean, what works in the US may not, you know, be necessarily hold true for Indian market. So, uh, I mean, this has purely given us an understanding of how you've spent your time in the classrooms in the US, across the world, when you go on teaching assignments, when you're invited for keynotes, and as well as, uh, I mean, we are really grateful to have you with us today at Watson University. Another question, uh, and this is the last question uh, as, as we have this conversation, is uh, this concept of chair professorship being initiated by Waxon University, where we are honoring the academic journey of some of the veteran academicians like yourselves. Uh, how do you see this move in the field of higher education and uh, what value does it hold uh, for a long term, uh, you know, success journey as, as we'll see in the next few years time. Uh, so I would like to know your thoughts on that. I think it's a very innovative idea because, uh, you know, normally shared professorships are somebody donating a bunch of money and, uh, and usually that is a family or somebody who's passed away. So there is really no ongoing connection uh, to the individual who is being honored. So here it's sort of a, you know, I'm glad this is being done before I die. So, you know, <laughs> and uh, so uh, the idea is uh, less of sort of a financial transfer. It's more like a, actually, and I see it as an intellectual partnership uh, where uh, the, uh, the role that I would play is to actually mentor a faculty member who is building a domain, in this case, digital marketing, and to actually help them with upgrading the curriculum and innovating. So. It's actually a partnership with the uh, recipient of the chair, which is a very interesting idea. And I think that if you build a network of these partnerships, then uh, you have effectively built for yourself at Waxen a virtual 
advisory board of some of the, the best minds and uh, and they in turn are supporting the faculty who are being uh, awarded the chair so it's a, i think it's a very innovative uh, idea uh, the the challenge is to sort of make sure that uh, uh, that there is literally a business plan for each of these partnerships uh, between the chair, chair professors and the, uh, the recipients and to create concrete milestones and to monitor progress and, uh, and to be prepared to adjust and adapt this initiative because it's not, I mean, things are going to change. It's not going to work out exactly the way you conceptualize it. So being agile, being adaptive and uh, seeing each of these as a uh, almost like a mini venture that needs to be made successful and not every one of these will work out which also you have to be prepared for so i think it's a an innovative idea and uh, it's the first time i've seen it done thank you so much uh, dr swani it's really uh, you know i i, I would say I've, I've had an insightful conversation today with you and uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us i'm sure that your journey will inspire millions of people as uh, we progress in the next few years time as well uh, 30 years just in one institution is not easy in today's time. But I'm sure that with, with your legacy, a lot of uh, young uh, professors who aim to become someone like you in, in your field or maybe in their field uh, would actually take a lot of inspiration and move forward and work along with the corporates just as you have very, I would say, passionately uh, immersed yourself in the Corporate Academia Connect. So thank you so much once again, and uh, it's a pleasure having you with us at Watson University, and we look forward to hosting you very soon again at our campus. Thank you very much, it's been a pleasure, and I uh, really enjoyed my, my visit and uh, value the continuing association. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, audience, for gluing to our conversation, and we'll be back very soon with another uh, academician as part of the chair professorship series. Today we had had uh, one of the brightest minds in the field of digital innovation, executive education and digital marketing uh, come and speak to us about the importance of this chair professorship initiative and his perspective about academia and uh, the corporate uh, you know, innovations that have taken place in the last few years and what is there for us to see in the next few years time. We'll be back uh, very soon. Stay tuned.